Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Okay, this, this talk is called Wear Your Body Armour. Wear Your Body Armour. Now, before we get into the scriptures, uh, the boys are just going to be setting a uh, video up. I just want to show you a quick two-odd minute video. I'll give you a bit of background to it and hopefully they can get the volume up. It's a podcast by a guy called uh, Jocko Willink and he's talking with his friends, friend. And these guys are ex-Navy SEALs in the U from the US military, so top special forces soldiers. And they run this pod podcast and they, they talk about all sorts of stuff, everything from military stuff to fitness to life issues. But they get people uh, writing in and asking questions. And in this particular clip, they get asked, how often did guys get shot in the body armour? Because they served in Ramadi in, during 2006 in Iraq. So they saw quite a lot of heavy fighting, these guys. And so they answer the question. So the first part of the question is just a general uh, sort of overview of what happens or how many times. And then the second part, they actually sort of hone into the, um, I guess, the body armour aspect, which is what I want to have a look at, because the Lord talks about this long before these guys actually came on the scene. And we'll, I'll sort of draw some conclusions. If the guys are ready and hopefully get the volume up. If, yep, go. Um. Okay, so just to summarise, if you didn't pick all that up, hope you heard, hope you heard it. So just got a couple of points just from there, just to summarise. So to answer the question, he was saying, the other guy, Leaf, was saying, guys were getting shot at all the time and getting hit all the time, okay? Um, and guys were not realising when they were first deployed the importance of their body armour. And despite all their training, their instructors would have told them, okay? And it's almost a question of, well, why do I need this? It's too heavy. It's too bulky. Um, they don't, in that sense, they didn't understand. 
Some of them, as he mentioned, that they even wanted to cut back their helmets, World War tiny little plates. Don't need this. Until they got into gun battles. Everything changed after that. Until death came calling, you know, within in inches. And then at the end there, you say they're going, can I have some more? Can I have bigger body armour? To the point where you're saying the army guys, not them, the army guys were kitted out like knights almost. And you think, you know, we thought armour went out, you know, hundreds of years ago when they invented, uh, you know, firearms. Apparently not. It's quite good. But the Lord spoke about this a long, long time ago. And I'm not going to go, this, this is a very famous scripture. I'm not going to go through all the bits and pieces of the armour necessarily. I just want to draw a couple of, I guess, a different points from different angles here. In Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 11, the Lord talked about this a long time ago about uh, to Christians. Verse 11, he says, Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against, against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. As I said, I'm not going to go through every piece. Our pastors have done a really good job over the years going over that. But what, what becomes clear when you sort of look at this video and then you look at these scriptures and what God had put this 2,000 years ago, he goes on in verse 11. I'll just pull it out. He goes, put on. Put on the whole armour of God, not bits and pieces, not picking and choosing, the whole lot, okay? Um, and he mentions that twice, okay? Then he goes on, verse 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand, that you can survive. So take, wherefore take the whole. Verse 14, stand therefore. Stand with it, okay? Okay? Um, Feet, your feet shod, so you, your boots on, so to speak. Verse 16, above all, really importantly, taking the shield of faith, taking your faith. Um, verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. And we know, you know, over the years we've, we've learned this, you know, the helmet of salvation, the knowledge of God and the shield of faith. And here in these verses, it's about us looking to the Lord and saying, Okay, this is what I need to take. The Lord's issued me with this. When you got filled with the Holy Spirit and you spoke in tongues, the Lord gave you all this. You may not, be, you may not have been good at using it necessarily, but as you grow, grow in the Lord, your faith would get stronger. Your belief would get stronger. Your understanding would get stronger. But it's a daily walk. Just like those guys had to go out every day doing their jobs and getting shot at every day, not knowing where, where it's going to come from. Like you see how that guy sort of poked his head up and got shot in the night vision? You don't know. We don't know what life might throw at us. And the, and, the, and the scriptures here are encouraging us, take the whole lot. What God's given you, take all the armour, take all the, 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 the tools that God has given you so you can you know, live a blessed, happy, prosperous life. So that if things do come against you, the Lord will get you through. The Lord will bless it for you. You will, you, you will be able to stand. You will be able to overcome. So a really important lesson to us. It's all about us taking it on. We don't just sit at home and go, okay, Lord, just give me faith, and then that's it. We've got to pray. We've got to read the, the scriptures. We've got to come to meetings, perhaps maybe even witness, you know, getting into the fray a bit, perhaps serving. It's all putting on the armour of God, and all the people said, praise the Lord. So I want to update it. Uh, I want to go not update. I want to go back to um, one Samuel chapter seventeen, the example of King da or David. It wasn't king at this stage. So really important. Take every piece of armor. Take every bit that God has given you. Don't neglect any of it. Don't cut it in half like those soldiers thought. Don't take a little bit of six inch faith. You know, well that's all I need. I'll be fine. I'll be right. I've been doing this for years. No. Everything God's given you, use it, maintain it. Now, we know this story. This story is really famous. It's, it's David and Goliath. I'll just to get a few uh, 
uh, uh, take a few thoughts and um, uh, observations about what David goes through. Verse 1, now the Philistines gathered together um, their armies to battle and were gathered together at uh, Shokoth, where belongs, which belongs to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekar in Ephraim's domain. And Saul, so he was king at the time, and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. So they're fighting this other nation. Verse 3, and the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass and he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. Uh, keep going. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed uh, 600 shekels of iron and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and you servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you um, and let him come down to me. If you be able to kill a fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then uh, shall you be our servants and serve us. So we see this situation where uh, the, the, the armies of God, the people of God are fighting this, uh, these people. They come against this trial. And then from this trial springs an even bigger one, a guy called Goliath, much bigger than Pedro. And he's got armour on all over. And, he, and that's how you... That's how your trials and tribulations can be. That's how they can seem. Without a doubt, nobody wants to you know, denigrate or, or look down on you know, anybody's trials and tribulations, whatever they may be. That's how they can be. Huge, imposing. This one was well-trained as well. The, the, the scriptures do say that. And then what, what we'll do is we'll pick it up, you know, just for the sake of time, we don't have a lot of time. We know about the young, the young boy, you know, cheeky young Dave, you know, comes, to the, to the battle to find out what's going on. Well, he was actually sent there by his dad. And in verse 20, And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. So his brothers were there as well. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spoke according to the same words, and David heard them. So David heard this mocking that was happening. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. So there wasn't a lot of faith being exercised here. There wasn't a lot of shield of faith being used here. Verse 25. The men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come against, that come up? Surely to defy Israel as he come up. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king, will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spoke to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that kills the Philistines and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after his manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that kills him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, so his, bro his old brother comes along, heard when he spoke unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why comest thou, come thou, comest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the haughtiness of thy heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest set the battle. And David said, Whatever have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned uh, from him toward another and spoke after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the same manner. So he's... A, he's, a, he's He's being uh, hassled by his older brother. What are you doing here? You know, this is dangerous. Don't be stupid. Don't be silly sort of thing. And he's getting hassled. But we see the story turns. And we, and we know the story. Verse 31. When the words uh, which, uh, were heard which David spoke, they rehearsed them before Saul and he sent for him. So we see here a difference of attitude. David is going, well, what's going to happen here? Let's, 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 let's take, this, take the fight to this trial. Let's overcome this trial. Who is this guy? What is this? And the rest of them are going, oh, well, you know, there's this, that, and his brother's having a go at him. Then they, they, the, the king hears about David's attitude. Verse 32, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. I'll do it. Teenager, I think he was. I'm not, not sure how old he was. Verse 33, And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man 
uh, of war from his youth. So there's that situation where you can't do this, you can't overcome this situation, and, and the king is right here. You know, you've got a uh, well-trained guy versus just, you know, a guy that keeps the sheep sort of thing. But we'll discover there's more to it. Verse 34, And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. They slew, thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine uh, shall be as one of them, seeing as defiled the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord has delivered me out of the paw of the lion, and out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine, and Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Verse 38. And Saul armed David with his armour, and, and he put on a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. Great. All right, great move, you know, quite logical. Makes sense. Verse 39. And David girded his sword upon his armour, and he essayed to go. He tried to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off. Hang on a minute. We've just been talking about putting on the whole armour of God. And what's David doing? He's leaving armour behind. Is that dumb? In the natural, you kind of think, yeah, you're a bit stupid, David. But he'd not proved this armour. This armour didn't belong to him. It wasn't his. He hadn't trained with it. He didn't know. It was foreign to him. What was his armour? He'd already told us what his armour, he'd already told the king what his armour was. It's between... Uh, the story that he told Saul from verse 34 to verse 37 about how the Lord protected him. That was his armour. He'd had faith in the Lord God. He had belief in the Lord God. He had trust in the Lord God. They were his armour. And he'd gone through these trials where he'd fought a lion and a bear to protect his uh, family's assets and wealth. And the Lord had delivered them through it. He had this testimony. That was his armour. And he knew without a shadow of doubt, the Lord is going to take care of me. That was his armour. Not these bits of metal and stuff that they were trying to hang on him and, and trying to get the natural solutions. And there's nothing wrong with natural solutions. You know, sometimes we have to go to the doctor. Sometimes you have to do that. You know, you've got to go to your accountant. You've got to, you know, fix your car. You've got to do those things. You can't just sit on your backside and do nothing sometimes. You've got to, you've got to do something. But go with faith in the Lord. Put it before the Lord first, because that's what David was saying here. That's how he, how he was leading. That's, that was his strategy. He wasn't trying to figure out all the details and ins and outs. I've got my faith. I know what the Lord has done before. I've heard the testimonies here. Sunday, Sundays, Fridays, Wednesdays at the house. We've all heard them. And he's taking with him that armour that he knows works. It's the same with us. We spoke in tongues. It works. We've seen people hurt, healed. We've been healed. It works. And all the people said, that's what the Lord wants us to take. It's simple as that. And we know the story. We won't go through the rest of the story. We know David wins there. Let's go to 1 Samuel 31 and see what happens a few years later to his boss, King Saul. And this is a really tragic end to somebody who was given everything by the Lord, if you like, was given armour, was given blessing, was given right and privilege to the people, with the people of God and the promises of God, and he squandered it. And that can happen to us if we don't take on the whole armour of God. We can get worn down. We can get taken out. We can get you know, confused, frustrated, and our salvation can get lost. This is sort of an ultimate, uh, you know, example of it, but I'm um, just sort of uh, a little bit of an analogy here. 1 Samuel chapter 31, Saul had been fighting the Philistines. And in verse 6, so Saul died. He was killed in the battle. And his three sons, so even his sons paid the price for his disobedience. If you know anything about Saul, he was, a, he was uh, disobedient. He went against the Lord and he squandered his uh, blessing. Um, and his three sons and his armour bearer and all his men the same day together. When the men of Israel that were on the other side of the valley and they that were on the saw that the men of Israel fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook the cities and fled and the Philistines came and dwelt in them. And it came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his three sons fallen in Gilboa. So the enemy, the Philistines, the pagans come and they find his body and they cut off his head 
and strip off his armour and sent into the land uh, of the Philistines round about to publish it in the house of their idols and, in, and among the people. And they put his armour in the house of Ashtaroth and they fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan. What a tragic end, what a sad end to somebody who, who could have had all the blessings of God before him. They cut off his head and as we know from Ephesians chapter 6, you know, the helmet of salvation, that's where the helmet goes. You know, the, the knowledge, the understanding of God was gone because he'd gone off the path, path little bit by little bit, by degrees. And what did they do with his armour? They put his armour in the house of Ashtoreth, one of their pagan goddesses. I think she was a goddess of, I forgot, forget now, um, Ashtoreth. Like the Easter goddess of Yeah, Ursa, yeah. Yeah, that's right, fertility and all that sort of stuff. But the pagan goddess, that's where his armour, that's where his spiritual armour, if you like, ended up. That's what happens to spirit-filled people when they lose their focus, when they go off the track. The, the, the armour of God gets fastened and becomes useless in, in some other you know, non-Christian area. In this case, it was pagan. And, and, and it was in a place called Beth Shan. And, and apparently some, some Bible scholars talk about how this is an area where uh, originally the, the Israelites were supposed to have kicked all the Philistines or the, the, the pagans out, and they didn't. And so these people, there's always this little thing, this little group niggling the Israelites here. They never really got rid of the bad stuff in their life or they never really dealt with the issues in their life. And it came back to bite them. And that's, that's the ultimate end. That's a bit of a tragic end. Uh, and I, I don't want to end it there. That, that's quite sad. Let's go up to uh, Psalm chapter 18. That's kind of just like the ultimate. You've got to be, we could, we could understand this. So this is where, you know, our spiritual armour could end up. And we don't want that. And that's where a lot of spirit-built churches end up. Their armour, their spiritual armour in their head, their knowledge of salvation is cut off and fastened to some worldly pagan, you know, ideas or ways of life. But we see here years later, Psalm 18, David's testimony of what he learnt through his faith, through putting on uh, the thoughts and the faith of God, putting on the armour every day, going out there, despite all these ups and downs. He was not perfect, we know. He made his mistakes. Psalm 18 is his, pretty much his testimony, all these psalms that he wrote. Verse 1, I love thee, O Lord, my strength. Now, he was a man of war. He knew how to fight. You can read some Old Testament scriptures there about when one of his sons came against him and one of the advisors said, be careful, your dad knows how to go out into the wilderness and live in the wilderness and fight out of the wilderness. He knows that. So that was David's natural skill. But the, David is saying here, God, you are my strength. That's where he drew strength on, from the Lord. Verse 2, the Lord is my rock. Now, I'm going to stand on that rock and the Lord is not going to move. It's not going to shift under me. I'm not going to lose my balance. You're not going to lose your spiritual balance when you're set standing on the Lord. And my fortress. Now, fortress is even better than, you know, armour. You've got your armour, but God is your fortress. That's, you know, that's a massive bit of armour. And my deliverer, God will find a way out for you. My God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, which is like a little shield, the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I'll call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. What a great testimony. And that's the one we can have. That's the one we do have. We hear so many great testimonies from saints, even today. You know, blessings and deliverances because the saints took on the armour of God every day, faithfully, simple, down to earth, just put on a bit of faith, have some prayer, keep it regular, you know, read the word of God, come and fellowship, serve the Lord God, have the attitude that, yes, the Lord can overcome whatever it may be. And all the people said, praise the Lord. One more verse, Acts chapter 2. I haven't talked about a lot about how you get this, but uh, if you're new here, for your sake... How do you get the armour of God? How do you get to the tools that God wants you to have so you can overcome? Well, it's very specialised. Um, if I was to say to you, how about you go down to the local Australian army barracks and go and ask them for all their armoury? Do you think they'll give it to you? No. That's right. Lots of people shaking their heads. And those Navy SEALs, they weren't just let in the Navy SEALs because they were cool guys. They didn't get really big like that because they were cool guys or they, they knew a bit or they, you know, had a bit of a tradition. They had to go to, through a strict process that the army set down to get in. 
God's no different. He's not slack. He has a process for how you enter the kingdom of God and what he issues you with. And on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, you can read about it, and the Holy Spirit first came, verse 1. And the day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind that filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and it sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So they received the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues. They knew they'd received something. And then just for the sake of time, Peter is asked about this and he explains how to get it. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? How do I get this? How do I get there? How do I get issued with this stuff? Verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptised every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Nice and simple. God will give it to you. And all the people said. We'll leave it there.